So welcome um, everyone to uh, the next Clear Mountain interview. We have uh, Ajahn Achalo here, a senior monastic in Thailand who are deep, deeply grateful to have with us. Ajahn Achalo um, was born in Brisbane, Australia in 1972. He developed a keen interest in meditation at the age of 20, and a year later left for Thailand to study Buddhism more intently. After a two-year period practicing in various centers and monasteries, in 1996, Ajahn Achalo ordained as a Theravada bhikkhu under Ajahn Liam at Wat Nam Bapong, the monastery founded by Venerable Ajahn Chah. Although most of his training has taken place in Thailand, Ajahn Achalo has also lived in several international force monasteries in the Ajahn Chah lineage. During his years of training, he has received personal guidance from many remarkable teachers, among them Longpur Sumedho, Longpur Pasano, Longpur Jayasaro, and Ajahn Kalyano. For most of his bhikkhu life, he is considered Tan Ajahn Anan, abbot of Wat Mapjan, to be his principal mentor. In addition, he has found the Dalai Lama's instruction and example to be of tremendous value. Ajahn Achalo is the founder and abbot of Anandagiri Forest Monastery in Pechibun, Thailand a monastery where monastics can be in semi-retreat mode most of the time, rather than having busier periods punctuated by intensive retreats. Ajahn Achalo, along with the resident monastics, the monastery committee, and a kind and generous group of supporters, have gone to a great deal of effort to develop spaces in which the local people and other day guests can come to meditate quietly, surrounded by a beautiful and supportive natural environment. Ajahn Achalo usually teaches one intensive retreat overseas each year, and leads a practice-based pilgrimage to India every two years. Much of his time, over 3,000 hours and counting, has been spent meditating at Bodh Gaya where the Buddha was enlightened. In addition to his duties as abbot, Ajahn Achalo has authored several books, including 3,000 Hours of Meditation, The Process of Realization, and Recollecting Bodhisattvas as well. Ajahn Achalo, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Lovely to see you, my too. Fresh-faced younger brothers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we were going to begin with Ajahn, Achalo, or, uh, Ajahn Kobilo's questions, if we may. Okay. Yeah, Tanajan, just uh, hearing about your biography, um, it seems like from such an early age, I mean, basically you came across meditation and then within a year traveled to Thailand. And then since that time have you know been repeatedly going back to India I'm just curious about your connection with these two countries. Like, what, what, what has it been that keeps drawing you back to, well, first, initially drawing you to Thailand, and then that which draws you back to, to India repeatedly? Yeah, so I guess it, it, I guess it starts with a feeling that I had in my childhood that Australia wasn't my home. So that was actually something that I did kind of viscerally feel from a fairly young age. And uh, I, mean, I guess that manifested as, you know, and, and in, in a way that was a, obviously a, a bit of a painful experience because there's a sense of it, it not, not feeling that a place is your home, but then not knowing where is home. But it did manifest it then as a sense of uh, seeking and looking for something. And uh, yeah, so that I guess that that feeling of seeking and looking for something also had ramifications in other aspects of my life. So when I was accepted to university, I, I didn't go because I had a intuitive sense that that was not going to be a path that would lead me to where I wanted to go. And I didn't know though where, I didn't know what path I would be on and where I would be going. But I did have a certain determination to find it and a certain openness to exploring different things until I did find it. And so uh, going to Thailand, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm probably going to come across as a little bit Weird, but anyway, that's the way it is. Um, I had, I did do a, I probably have to start 
I think I have to start with my meditation practice. That would make more sense. So I would say the very beginning of my meditation practice was actually lying on the beach in Australia. And Australians tend to spend a lot of time on the beach. And when I was a little child, we didn't know as much as we do now about skin cancer. And so we would lie literally for hours in the sun. And uh, so my sisters were trying to get like full body tans. And when I was a little boy, I just had to wait for them to, you know, you know, left side, right side, front side, back side. And, uh, and lying there on the sand and listening to the, the sound of the waves of the Pacific Ocean and actually kind of going through restlessness and boredom, like we'd already been for a swim, I'd already wrestled with my brothers, we'd already built sandcastles, we'd already collected shells, and then we were lying on, the, on our towels, wondering when our sisters would be finished with their sun baking. And, but in just having to be there and, go, and kind of something happened in listening to the waves, because just such a, you know, when the beach where I grew up, we were in rural Australia and the beach where I grew up, I mean, I think very often we would not have seen anyone else there. It, it was a very remote. And it's not like that anymore, but it was 40 years ago. And yeah, it's just this vast empty space with the sound of the waves breaking. And there's something about the, that sound of waves breaking on the ocean that's, it's not, it's not, there's no kind of logical pattern there. There's no, it's every single moment is changing and every single wave is different and, and the sounds are at different depths and distances and have different tones. And I think my mind would find this space of kind of listening evenly to all of the waves without choosing or discriminating or commenting and would actually find some fairly spacious mind states. And so that was, that was what it was, is how I would identify the beginning of my meditation practice. Unfortunately, we ended up having to move from that part of Australia when my father got a new job. We ended up moving to the suburbs and away from the beach. But I do think that uh, experience in childhood fairly frequently uh, had already communicated to a deeper level of the mind that there is there is something there is mental happiness or there is mental peace there is there is something else other than uh you know materialism yeah. and my parents were deeply committed to materialism and they were often complaining about not having enough money and and uh we would get into arguments sometimes because they want my mum wanted me to be a lawyer, and my dad wanted me to be a doctor. And uh, they asked me. I mean, I think they both recognised that the intelligence was there if I would apply it. But getting me to apply it in that way was it was a different matter. And so we would we used to argue. They were, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I said, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, well, why won't you do what we're telling you to do? And I, I was, you know, some people would consider this very rude. I said to them, um, if I follow your advice, I'm going to end up like you. Hmm. And I don't want to be like you. So uh, <laughs> that was kind of a <laughs> conversation ender. So what are you going to do? I don't know. And so I, I, my father had wanted to go to university and his father had ended up dying and at a young age, from a cerebral enema, Ed, uh, yeah, what are those things called? Aneurysm. Mm -hmm. Aneurysm. And yeah, so he hadn't been able to go to university, and he wanted me. You know, parents often do this. He wanted me to fulfil his dream to become uh, university educated. And uh, so I didn't. I tried to let them down gently by telling them that I deferred the course, but actually I just rejected it. Uh, outright and gave myself a year to to find the guts to tell them and I told them I was saving money to, to go to university the, the following year and uh, when the following year came I had found the courage to tell them no I'm not going to university I'm going to Sydney to study acting <laughs> mm. and uh, yeah 
when I was in Sydney and I was studying acting, I, I was interested in the process of, you know, what makes a character tick, what makes them be a certain way, why do they experience such emotions, how does one generate that emotion. I was interested in essentially the mind and emotions and conditioning. But when it came to meeting with the agent and seeing all the pictures of the people on the walls, um, you know, I just had this really strong sense of I don't want to be a product and I don't want to be competing. So then I didn't know what I was going to do. And I, I was basically working in coffee shops and restaurants. And uh, one, I did do the Vipassana, Goenka Vipassana retreat. So I had been interested in meditation since I was 15. I learned a white light meditation uh, method hmm. in a new age shop. And the new age shop was called the Bodhi Tree Bookstore, which was interesting. And uh, this lady had taught me about visualizing white light, putting myself in a white bubble. And um, so I, I'd done that. Ever since I'd learned that, I basically did it every day. And if I didn't do it, I kind of felt if I went to school, if I hadn't done it, I felt like something was missing. You know, I hadn't put myself in my white bubble. I hadn't washed my aura. And um, so I, I did it religiously. And so the people in the coffee shops where I was working knew that I did this method. And several of them had done a Goenka and they retreat. And so they suggested to me, you like meditation, you should do this 10 day retreat. I had no idea at the time it was Buddhism, but that was the beginning of my Buddhist practice was at a 10 day intensive Vipassana retreat with 12 hours of sitting a day. That was how my full official Buddhist uh, practice began. And I wanted to run away, but it was, it was so much pain. I mean, hardly ever sat on the floor. My white light meditation had been on a bed. And um, <laughs> so it was like 12 hours of sitting on the floor, knee pain, lower back pain, shoulder pain. And it was so far away in the countryside and my sister dropped me off and it was before mobile phones. And so running away wasn't really an option. Hmm. I, had to, I had to stick it out for 10 days. Fortunately, on day eight, with uh, Mr. Goenkaji's prompting, start again, start again, then... I experienced a, a genuinely peaceful mind state where I felt cool, full, content. And there was, this, after that, after that experience, which may have, I don't know exactly how long it lasted, it may have only lasted 10, 20 or 30 seconds, but it was, it was deeply peaceful compared to my usual state. And there was... What was interesting also about that experience was the recognition that came straight afterwards. There was this sense of that is what I'm looking for. Hmm. And it was enormously helpful for me because I had been wondering what I'm going to do with my life. And then the other thing was Goenkaji talked about dukkha as the characteristic of conditions. And I had been really struggling because, you know, I had friends who were studying acting and singing who were very deeply committed to being ambitious along that path. And I had other people that were just washing dishes, but they were getting university degrees and they were committed to other paths. And, and I was just, I knew for myself that a good job wouldn't make me happy. I just, I just knew that even if I was to study the subjects that were presented to me, and even if I got a good job, I just knew that would not make me happy. And if I was, I had relationships. I knew that if I was in relationship with beautiful people, even in love, that also wouldn't make me happy. So I was wondering what's wrong with me. Why is hmm. having a career and being in love enough for other people? And what's wrong with me that I know that that will never be enough. And it, and it was not fair to the other person either because they're going to be looking at you thinking like, I can't make him happy. <laughs> and it's a, it's, a, it's a horrible. And in hindsight now, I think this is the result of past life practice. I think, mm. I think past life practice is going to manifest as weariness and recognizing dukkha more quickly. This is actually how wisdom, I think, manifests is you see the futility 
and the fleeting nature of sensual pleasure faster and you you kind of intuitively know it's not going to work as a refuge and so so those experiences as a bit of a preface uh were orienting on my kind of consciousness to be willing to take some bigger leaps and so one night i was washing i was uh, you know i had to mop the floor at the the vegan uh, restaurant where I vegan macrobiotic restaurant where I worked. I had to <laughs> mop the floor and uh, <laughs> yeah, you know the whole scene, yoga and and uh, yeah, which I'm yeah, grateful for. I I was uh, you know after the mop after I mopped the floor, I I walked out onto the footpath and I I don't know why, and I think this is past life imprints as well. Like I did not believe in a creator god but I did believe in angels hmm. and I didn't at that stage, I did not yet believe in hell either, but I did believe that there were benevolent beings in heaven realms who, who may help. Hmm. And I don't know where that view came from. My parents didn't allow me to go to church. So I didn't, I didn't get it from my childhood. And so I walked out onto the footpath and I looked to the sky and I made, I guess, what we would call an aditana. I looked to the sky and I said, I admit that I don't know the true path to happiness. But if you show me, and I was talking to the invisible beings in the sky, if you send me a sign, I promise that I will follow. Show me the true path to peace and happiness. Hmm. Now, I had, I had already had a daily meditation practice at that point, but I didn't have a life style that, that had meaning yet. Hmm. And uh, I wasn't completely convinced about the precepts yet. Being, having been born in Australia and living in inner city Sydney, I, you know, I had taken on that daily meditation was helpful, but I had not yet, I wasn't yet completely convinced that you know, those rules that came later. And uh, so anyway, I think there's a few things there. One is I was very sincere. I really meant it like to the very, with every fiber of the, of my being and to the bones, I really meant it. I think that's an important factor. I think another important factor is merits from past lives because with, within a few days, interesting things started happening. So I had no kind of strong feeling about Thailand until that point. I think one friend had been and had had a good experience. So anyway, somebody left their Lonely Planet guide to Thailand on the bench of the restaurant where I worked hmm. a few days later. And I picked up that book and I just started to read the introduction and I noticed that it said that Thailand was a 95% Buddhist country. And I had been doing this uh, Vipassana meditation, Goenka style, for about a year then. And I knew it was a Buddhist method. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I just, just that much got me thinking, maybe I should travel. You know, maybe it's time to go overseas. I hadn't been overseas at the time. And so the next day, the person who owned the book came back and wanted the book back. But it was a thin end of the wedge. Another week later, it was payday. In those days, we got cash in an envelope. And I opened up my wallet, and there was a, a strange coin in there. And I, I asked my friend. It, it actually had Chedi's on it and the, the Thai king. Hmm. And I asked my friend, what is this? And I can't remember if it was one baht or five baht or ten baht. But she said, that's Thai baht. That's Thai money. Hmm. And this time, the hairs on my arms went up in a kind of a you know, twilight zone. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and then I can't remember exactly how many days later, but another curious thing happened. I had noticed those two things because, you know, I was looking for signs. I'd asked for signs, so I was interpreting things as signs. And, uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a kind of an Asian thing to do, isn't it? To be making prayers and invocations and asking for omens and... Uh, Anyway, so I used to have to clean the fryer in the restaurant where I worked and once a week. 
and I used to have to drain the oil out of the fryer. Now, it was a Japanese-inspired restaurant. The fryer was from Germany, Dorf, I believe. And there was this piece of galvanized metal that I used to have to screw onto the pipe to release the oil. And it had one word on it I'd never noticed. And at this night, I was putting this galvanized pipe on the fryer, and the word said, Thailand. <laughs> Now, why there was a piece of galvanized pipe from Thailand in a macrobiotic vegan restaurant in Australia, I don't know, because, you know, Australia has its own metal producing <laughs> <laughs> companies. But I stood up and I said, that's it. I'm going to Thailand within 10 weeks. Mm. And uh, a couple of weeks before I left, I had a ticket, I had a passport, and... I didn't have any money. So I had to sell my Turkish rug, my mountain bike, my computer, my bed to get, to get a thousand dollars. And, uh, which, you know, 30, 25, 27 years ago was a significant sum. And literally three days before I left, I think it was a Canadian backpacker came into the restaurant asking for a job. And she asked, uh, is there a job here? And I said, well, there may be because I'm just about to leave. Hmm. She said, where are you going? I said, Thailand. She says, why are you going? I said, well, I'm interested. I want to go to the beach. It was coming up to winter. I said, I want to go to the beach. I hate winter. And I'm interested in meditation. And she said the most fascinating thing. She says, I just came from Thailand yesterday. <laughs> and there's a meditation center on a tropical island with the view of the sea. <laughs> and I'm like, well, this was before Google. So I, I asked her, could you please write that down. That's how we used to do things in the old days. <laughs> she used to write a, write a note on a piece of paper and, uh, and store it away in my wallet. It just so happened that that meditation center had two English speaking meditation teachers, an American man and an Australian woman who had been teaching backpackers 10 day retreats. And uh, I know my story is going on a bit, but uh, I'll try to make it a bit more condensed. Yeah, so they were teaching reflective meditations and samatha practices as well as the Goenka method, and this was enormously helpful. But the environment was helpful too. Like, I don't think I could have... Essentially, I lived in that meditation center for five out of nine months. Now, I don't think that would have been possible for the sensual, restless man that I was. In a, I don't think I could have done that in Australia. It was a combination of nice curries, uh, beautiful storm clouds blowing in over the, uh, the Gulf of Thailand Sea, coconut palms swaying in the breeze, uh, funny nuns. And I used to kind of, <laughs> I used to peel the coconuts for the nuns and they used to kind of spank me. I mean, they're in their seventies. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was just a combination of, and you know that she was Australian, uh, Rosemary was Australian. There was a kind of a resonance with that. And that these people had studied with a good number of teachers in Thailand and had kind of condensed the teachings into a, a retreat format where they were teaching metta meditation and death reflection and the law of karma, recognizing one's good fortune, all sorts of things that uh, really helped me to develop my reflective faculty and to understand that mind states could be changed and cultivated and developed and abandoned, you know, a real... They really helped me learn that uh, the mind is a malleable thing that can be cultivated. And that, again, I wasn't convinced about the precepts yet, but when I, when I went to do my visa run and I broke one or two of them, hmm. I had to notice that my mind, you know, you're in the meditation center, you can't break the precepts and you've got to meditate twice a day and and they had this situation where you would sit one of their retreats and then help serve in another retreat and then sit a retreat and then help serve. So it's a nice combination. And I would notice when I broke the precepts and came back that my mind was more dull and less happy. And, you know, I was observant enough to notice that, that begin to see the way that chelases lie to you. If you just do this once, you'll feel better. You, do, you can do it. It's okay. Hmm. And actually that thought's occurring within some, a certain amount of clarity and spaciousness. Mm. And then when you go and you break the rule, the clarity and the spaciousness is gone and the mind isn't happier. Mm. And 
you know, I did that a few times, so I really began to notice. I'm like, gosh, it looks like the Buddha might have actually known what he was talking about when, <laughs> when, he, when he recommended the five precepts. <laughs> <laughs> and so I begrudgingly took on that part of the program too. And uh, so it was there that from there I went back to Australia because my money ran out. And uh, interesting things continued to happen. I was waking up in the morning already weeping. That's how much I missed Thailand. Hmm. I was like, pre-consciously, tears were already kind of, there was this kind of grief about, uh, yeah, because I remember going for a jog on Koh Phangan Island, and it kind of, I was looking out, I was standing on this hill, and I was looking out into the Gulf of Thailand, and it kind of hit me viscerally in my body. It's like, oh, this feels like home. And it was the first time I'd had that experience in, in this world. Hmm. And I couldn't, I don't think I could speak a word of Thai yet. Hmm. And uh, so, yeah, there was that, there was that recognition. And then coming back to Sydney, there was this real sense of this isn't my place. And, uh, you know, there's wonderful things about Australia and there's things that I still miss, but uh, I guess karmic affinity. So I was, you know, I always started massaging people at the hospice. I was doing the Buddhist layman kind of, you know, death, contemplating death and dying, volunteering at the hospice back at the vegan cafe and uh, redecorated my studio apartment with a Buddhist theme. <laughs> and um, some interesting things began to happen. I, I had a friend who was a taxi driver and he says, you know, you've really changed and I want some of whatever it is that happened to you. I want to do that meditation retreat. And he said, I don't want to wait for you to save the money. So I'm offering you the ticket. And then uh, my best friend at the time was studying naturopathy and she said, I'll rent your apartment. I need a place in town. Hmm. And so, you know, I was literally set up to, to do my, you know, Buddhist lifestyle thing. And uh, yeah, I was back in Thailand, I think within 10 weeks. <laughs> and so, yeah, obviously that suggests karma, right? And an interesting thing, you know, you know, I have an interest in Theravada and, and Mahayana, and an interesting thing happened. I, I met a man at this meditation center back, back on Koh Phangan Island, and he'd just been to Wat Nanachat. He was a German man. And like I said, we didn't have Google yet. I had no idea, even though I'd already spent nine months in Asia, that there was a monastery for English-speaking people in Ubon Ratchatani. Hmm. He told me that. And... And then Stephen Rosemary, the teachers, said that there was a monastery in Taiwan where you could live and teach English to the novices. And I, I had this choice. Do I go to Taiwan and teach English to the novices or do I go to the forest monastery in Ubon Ratchatani? And I chose Ubon Ratchatani, obviously. And so, yeah, I went to Wat Nana Chat. And uh, so many, so many, th I'm so grateful that the process went as it did because if I turned up at Nanachak first without the tropical island in between, I wouldn't have been able to surrender to that level of, of austerity and discipline. I wouldn't have been able to. Mm. There was this, you know, as the Buddha talks about the wet stick needing to be put on the bank and drying out. So some of that had been happening. <laughs> My wet stick was, was partially dried out already by the time I turned up, turned up there. And I'd also kind of surrendered to the fact that um, I, don't, I wasn't going to be capable of a, a, a worldly kind of a lifestyle. And I, I, hadn't real, I hadn't worked out yet how is meditation going to be a part of my life and how am I going to pay the bills? Hmm. And um, so at Wat Nana Tat, I felt strangely at home and it was a very strange experience because there were many, many things I didn't like. And it felt like the right place. I mean, I, I, did that, I had that deep intuitive sense of, well, this is where you need to be now. Mm. And so, yeah, I went. I, th but the fact that you could be an eight preceptor and then a ten preceptor and take it mm. step by step, that was, um, I, I would not have been able to commit to a five-year from day one uh, commitment I, I wouldn't have I I had to get through the first well I had to get through week by week you know 
So yeah, that would suggest some karmic connection with Thailand, right? That just mm. when I asked for guidance where I needed to be, then I was kind of pointed in the direction of Thailand. And then when I was there, I did feel at home. And uh, when I left it, I missed it. With regards to India, that was the second part of the, the question, was, you know, when I was in high school, we watched the movie A Passage to India and we read the book A Passage to India. I think I was 16 in my English class. It was at E.M. Foster, I think. And I was captivated. And the human resources teacher, a lady, a lady by the name of Jana Marisova, she, uh, yeah, interesting name. <laughs> She'd been to India and she came and gave our, a class a talk about her trip to India and showed us some, I think she might have had a slideshow. And something really stirred in me. And I was like, yeah, I want to go to India. I want to go to India. And she was encouraging us. She was actually encouraging people to take a gap year, travel, learn a bit about the world before getting the degree. And, I, you know, I heard that. I liked her. I really resonated. She was really groovy. I mean, we were in this, we were in, by that stage, we were in this rural country town. My dad had to change jobs. We had to move schools from the city, and, and we hated it, my twin brother and I. And my younger brother, we hated it. But there was this groovy teacher who did yoga and was vegan and read tarot cards. And like she, <laughs> she was great. And, uh, yeah, she, she gave that kind of suggestion. And I think that was uh, instrumental in giving me the courage to, uh, to actually do something like that and not go straight into university, think about life, travel around a bit. And I got this Ravi Shankar record from the secondhand record shop when I was 17, when I'd left home. And I played this Ravi Shankar record. And I remember just weeping. Like, again, I suppose there was this feeling of rec recognizing something. And, you know, there, as I'd mentioned, there was a feeling of I'm not, I'm not in my place. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not in my home. And uh, there was something about this which kind of suggested home, but it, it also seemed so far away. And, uh, but I set some kind of resolution. I'm, I am going to go to India. And then once I was a monk, you know, I started hearing, you know, I think there was, we used to get, before he'd published it as a book, we'd hear the occasional story about Arjun Sachito and Nick's adventure in, Hmm. Nick Scott's adventure in India and then a couple of terrors when I was at Nanachat were planning a Tudong in India and they went and I remember saying to Ajahn Jayasari, Tanata, you know, a lot of these junior monks, we don't have such strong faith and we've got a lot of doubts and I did, you know, I'm a faith type, I did believe that going and paying respects to the holy sites would make good karma and I said to Ajahn Jayasari, you know, you should lead a pilgrimage and you should invite some monks we could pay respects to the holy sites and that would increase our merits and that would increase our chances of staying monks for longer. And so the following year, Tanajan Jayasari went to India hmm. and he didn't invite me. <laughs> <laughs> and half the monks he took with him have since disrobed. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I asked him, why didn't you invite me? It was my suggestion. <laughs> And he says, Achlo, I have no doubt in the future you will be invited to India. Mm. <laughs> you will go in your own time. And uh, so I, again, I'm mean, being a bit more of a, a bit of a faith type who knows something about the, making aritanas. After my fifth pansa, I went on a tudong and I walked to Patat Panom Chedi. This was a bit weird to most forest monks who go on Turongs try to find a quiet forest to practice in. I, I started walking to sacred chedis. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's something I learned about my character when I got out of Wat Nanachat, when you're just kind of feeling your own edges under the sky and the winds blowing against your face and you, you start to be able to make some choices and mm. directions for your practice in that Majima period after five years. It's like, I decided to walk to Tat Panom Chedi and I noticed that despite the fact that it was busy, my m mind became peculiarly peaceful. And oh, that's interesting. And then I went to the place in Sakon Nakon where there are some relics of Lumpur Man. I was doing this as a kind of a puja, 
to him in gratitude, recognizing that my life as a bhikkhu had been much more comfortable and in part I'd been supported because of his great practice and fame and I wanted to honor that. And so I walked, I guess it's nearly 300 kilometers from Wat Nanachat to Tat Panom and Tat Panom to Sakonakon. And uh, then I got food poisoning. <laughs> and I, so I wasn't, I was going to walk all the way to Chiang Mai. And I'm like, two bouts of food poisoning in three weeks uh, had me rethinking my plan. So I, I caught a bus from Sakonakon to Uttaradit taking a couple of hundred kilometers off the journey and decided to walk along the train tracks from Uttaradit to Chiang Mai. And I made the four Buddhas footprints holy site my destination. Hmm. And uh, Tanajanan had told me about that place of when I was asking about places to go and pay respects. And walking along, I learned something about my character during that Tudong. My mind was kind of would, would fall into depression, you know, seeing how many of the trees had been chopped down and seeing how much litter there was on the side of the road. And we've got these great biographies of these great monks, but the, it was really a different world, even though it was just a, a generation or two ago. It's largely gone. It's, Thailand isn't like that now. And there was some kind of dejection about that. And I remember I'd asked Sajan Anand, well, who are these five Buddhas, you know, and and I'd learned that there was Kakusando, Konegamano, Kasapa Buddhas before Gotama, mm -hmm. and that there would then be Maitreya. And I started reciting a mantra as I was walking along the train tracks. Namo Kakusando Buddha, no, Namo Konegamano Buddha, Namo Kasapa Buddha, Namo Gotama Buddha, Namo, namo Meiteo Buddha. And my mind would find a happy abiding. And I was basically learning that I was a faith type that should do more samatha practices, more anusatis, hmm. and uh, bodhisattva nusati and buddha nusati being, when I was going to the place where purportedly four of those buddhists had made an imprint into a big rock and put some of their blessings there. So it was like, and then there was this long trail track and there's this sense of I'm going to pay respect to the buddhas of this eon. The whole thing took on a, um, a joyful it became a faith practice and uh, it wasn't it was the mind wasn't focusing on the fact that the trees were gone and there was lots of litter it was uh, thinking about the buddha's enlightenment and was happy yeah. so when i got to that five buddha's footprints i made an aditan due to this merit having paid respects to the four buddha's footprints may i be invited to pay respects to the four holy sites mm in India. And three days later I was. Hmm. So I was a five panza bhikkhu and uh, a Thai lady who used to work in Washington State actually, Pullman University. And uh, she was hmm. visiting Thailand. She had a house in Merim. She'd invited me to stay there on the upper floor. And uh, she popped in and she'd been confused like, what are you, what are you doing this for? What are you walking around getting sunburned and cracked feet and blisters when you have a perfectly good monastery, why do you do this? And I'm like, well, practicing with more difficulty causes us to develop more spiritual qualities, patient endurance, determination, and uh, I, want to, I want to do that. I want to do some of that as uh, partly as a gesture of respect towards Lumpur Man and Lumpur Cha and... Uh, but also, you know, you've been in the institutions for five years. You want to get out on the open road and feel your own edges and, and just uh, think about what you're going to do for the next few years. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, she said, thinking about what, you, what you're doing and why you're doing it reminded me that I've always wanted to go on a pilgrimage to India. And uh, I'd like to invite you. Mm -hmm. So I was invited to India, and uh, that, I think that was, yeah, that was early January. We didn't end up going until December. It took, takes a while to, to sort these things out. But, yeah, when I, when I was in Pugaya, I remember being very frustrated because we, we pulled up in the train, and we had to go to this very, very nice hotel. And uh, it was a, you know, it was a nice pilgrimage and I remember being extremely frustrated I wanted to go straight to the Bodhi tree 
And uh, when I meditated under the Bodhi tree, so it was a, one of those whistle stop seven day. And in those days, it was much harder. Like we caught the train from Calcutta, there wasn't direct flights to Bodh Gaya. And the trip from Bodh Gaya to Varanasi was a 12 hour drive. It's now a six hour drive. And so, you know, in a seven day four holy sites pilgrimage, you, your memory of that is predominantly the bus. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but we had one day in Bodh Gaya. And so I remember just meditating under the Bodhi tree and I can't describe it. It's just like, it's almost like you could smell, touch, taste, Nibbana, enlightenment. Mm -hmm. It was just like, it just mm -hmm. seemed closer there. And so, you know, there was this fabulous meal that was going to be happening at this great hotel. And then there was, people were going to be visiting the international Buddhist temples around Bodh Gaya, which would have been very interesting. And I actually said, do you mind if I skip lunch and spend the mm -hmm. entire day here? And yeah, that experience of, it was probably experiencing Upajara Samadhi. And the thing about experiencing Upajara Samadhi in a, in a place which has the blessings of an enlightened being, the quality of the rapture and the tranquility is is heightened, is greater than, than what you would experience in your kuti or in your dwelling in your ordinary situation. So even on just that one day experience, there was this sense of touching something more subtle, more serene, more rapturous, more... And there was also a bit of frustration. I felt so close to Nibbana, but I didn't get it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this sense of, but I'm definitely coming back. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was, when I was talking about this experience, we went to that. It was a 12-day pilgrimage, but the last four days were in Nepal. And uh, so we went to Lumbini, and then we went to Pokhara, and then we went to Kathmandu, by which, by which point I had a terrible chest infection and was bedridden. But I'd mentioned to Dr. Patria, the Thai lady who'd invited me, that I'd really like to go back to Bogaya. And the, the people in the... Um, pilgrimage group took up a collection and uh, helped Tananandu and myself fly back from Kathmandu to Varanasi. Hmm. There were flights and spend another month in Bodh Gaya. Hmm. And as wonderful as that sounds, it was the coldest winter in a hundred years and we hadn't prepared properly. And I, I caught a second chest infection and uh, that, that feeling of being close to Nibbana that didn't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> the Dalai Lama passed through and gave a Kala Chakra initiation and there was just the Tibetans painted the town red as it were and uh, they were a little bit obnoxious when they when they when they're in large numbers they kind of take over and uh, yeah a combination of noise dust pollution excrement sickness it wasn't the same as the first time around but I did set I did, you know, I, I guess deepen my karmic affinity and I think it was at the end of my relationship to determination. I, like I said, I wasn't able to commit to five years off the bat. I had to approach it slowly and gently. I think I've said this in many talks. The first six days out of seven in my first few years, I wanted to disrobe. And mm. one day out of seven it was more peaceful than my, my lay life and I was content. And, and, you know, as the years went by, there were less, I want to disrobe days and more contented days. And, mm -hmm. uh, so when I got to 10 punters, so the way I had to approach it was after one puncher, I determined one more puncher after two punters, I determined one more puncher after three punters, I determined two more punters after five punters, I determined <laughs> five more punters. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to 10, I had to ask myself, so are you going to continue with this? And I realized that I wanted to, but I felt like I needed to make some kind of significant gesture because at that stage I was going to commit for another 10 years. Said, okay, well, that's a serious commitment. And the thought came back that I should, I should go and make that pledge in Bukaya. The previous trip being four years before that. And so I went back and I think I spent, yeah, I spent seven weeks in Bodh Gaya after my 10th Pantsar and made the vow to, to stay for another 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then 
I think what it was was being a new abbot. Oh, I mean, that's another whole conversation, but uh, <laughs> becoming an abbot, I knew it was going to be hard and it was, I'm not exaggerating, 10 times harder than I thought. <laughs> and, uh, but the, a building supplies company that helped me in establishing this monastery, they, they invited myself and a couple of other monks on a pilgrimage. And it was the first time that I realized just how good the Thai tour guides are and the Thai mm. tour companies are. They did such a good job of taking care of all of the logistics. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. I, I, I you know, that the idea began to formulate that oh, this might be possible if there are really skilled professional people who can take care of all of that. It might be possible for me to lead a group if all if if I'm able to lead chanting meditations, read from suttas, and yeah. Hmm. So that was my kind of glimpse of yeah the uh, a kind of a higher what's the word upper middle pilgrimage experience <laughs> upper middle yeah. way pilgrimage experience and. Um, yeah, so I ended up going to Australia and teaching in Australia for a period of time at the Buddha Society of Victoria. And uh, some people there asked me, please lead a pilgrimage. And so I, I did. And uh, there was something about, you know, I kind of felt like I was drowning in the building a monastery experience. And... I think being able to go to Bogaya saved me as an abbot and as a monk, actually. Hmm. And it, uh, as a practice monk, it saved me. Hmm. Because, you know, when you've got building projects and reforestation projects and retreats to teach and there's a whole bunch of things you have to get done and there's a whole bunch of whatever skills you have, you have to in improve and increase them and whatever skills you don't have, you you need to get them together. It's a very exhausting experience. And uh, I found that uh, getting on the plane and going back to Bogaya, Anandagiri just disappeared <laughs> in that experience. And being able to completely put it down for a month or six weeks at a time was just enormously helpful. And then re-establishing my uh, meditation discipline. And so I did that a couple of times, and then it, and then it occurred to me at what, at some stage that I calculated how many hours I was doing, and it occurred to me that if I did a couple of hundred more, I'd get to a thousand hours. Hmm. And I was thinking, well, that would be good for my confidence and happiness, and you know, that would be a good thing to remember. And so, I, yeah, I did. I asked Pavro's permission to stay on an extra couple of weeks and uh, meditated to the point of getting to a thousand hours. And that's when I, that's when in a, I don't know, temporary insanity, you know, I was, I was feeling rapturously happy and I determined to do another 2000 hours, <laughs> a thousand to the Buddha, a thousand to the Dhamma and a thousand to the Sangha. And uh, hmm. so then, then going to India actually became something I had to do. And I started doing it like twice a year to fu to fulfill this vow. But I'm so I'm so grateful that low cost airlines had were happening by that stage, mm. and that there was an airport in Bogaya, and you know, Bogaya became simply a three hour flight away, mm -hmm. a place that I went twice a year, and it it became one of my homes, one of the places where I lived this lifetime because I've now been to India eighteen times. Hmm. And uh, I think if you put all of my trips together, I've spent nearly two years there. So. Hmm. Tana this is very, very interesting. I mean, your biography is, you know, somewhat similar to other Westerners who come across Buddhism and that you were highly inspired in the beginning by meditation. I mean, that's a very common thing, but a thread which goes through your, yeah, from your initial interest on, it sounds like to the present day is this, um, aspect of intuition, having a sense and really being searching for, making determinations, resolutions, 
to find a home and really to, to stay at, at those homes, whether it's um, initially Thailand and then Nanachat and then finding a home in these different meditation objects. You mentioned the uh, white light, et cetera, really searching for and finding a home. And this is an aspect uh, which I think many Westerners don't find. You know, they start off with meditation and it's a very cerebral um, aspect of their lives. And they aren't able to tap into the intuitive aspect of their practice and aren't able to find a home. And I'm curious if you're uh, able to give any guidance since it seems like it's just come so naturally for you for whatever reasons. Uh, if you can give guidance to people who don't yet, aren't yet able to tap into this intuitive sense and find a home in the Dhamma, in the Dharma, in, in Buddhism. So I also teach people and I guess most of my students are Asian. Maybe 70% of my students are Asian and probably of a faith proclivity. So a lot of the people who I teach share the kind of faith that I have. And, you know, I, long story short, I think I was an Asian that got brought into a white body, right? Mm. And, uh, and I don't have any regrets about that. I, you know, it's like different. You learn new things and try new things, learn new things. Mm. There's things I appreciate about Australia, but, um, you know, when I, when I go to Europe, I feel like I'm walking around in a postcard and um, it just feels very foreign to me. Mm. And I, I have spent periods of time in Amarawati and my kind of, my kind of gut intuition, I remember kind of meditating in that space with the other members of that Sangha and my kind of, I could be wrong, but I had an intuitive sense that many of the people had had a strong Christian past hmm. and as a result of very good virtue and great faith and a lot of merits and the contemplations and sincere investigation, they found Buddhist teachings and they resonated. But they didn't feel like old, deep Buddhists to me. <laughs> and I guess I would, I probably am an old, deep Buddhist. <laughs> and there's something, there's the thing about Buddhist meditation, the, you know, Anapanasati, it's not conceptual. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a contemplation. I mean, one can contemplate the breath or arising and ceasing, but in terms of, in terms of taking the breath as a meditation object, and that being something in the very center of experience, which allows you to put down thoughts because you're picking up the breath, put down thoughts, put down concepts, and abide in the middle of experience with, with something else that isn't thoughts mm. and concepts. I think that uh, opens up the intuition. Mm. Whereas being attached to thoughts and identifying with thoughts probably cuts it off. So, uh, but like I said, I do think my childhood probably had something to do with how, how that, I mean, a lot of people are connected to their intuition and that kind of sense of awe for the, for nature and the amazingness of the world when they're very young and it gets kind of educated out of them. Mm. But I think riding around on BMX bikes on wide open roads and lying on the beaches and listening to the seas and looking at horizons and uh, not many other people being around, I think that was a factor. Mm. The benevolence of the nature in northern New South Wales where I lived was a factor. And, uh, but I think another factor means I do, I do know some very gifted monks who have told me some things about my past lives. So. I think uh, having been a Buddhist monk in India and uh, having lived in Thailand uh, are the factors in why you one would feel at home in such places. Hmm. But in terms of, you know, Lumpur Cha, he actually wrote a talk, didn't he? He, got, he gave a talk to a, a woman who was 
in the later stages of death and dying, and, uh, called Our Real Home. And he was talking about that, uh, putting things down, preparing to go to the only thing you can take with you, to clarity, awareness, presence of mind. And, um, yeah, I, the only advice I can give is really disciplined meditation, a deep commitment to a disciplined meditation practice that will help a person go beyond concepts and identification with thoughts for periods of mind, periods of time. That's like the chinks in the armor. Hmm. Yeah. Just uh, that you can experience something that isn't related to the self view, thinking about the past and the future and opinions and right and wrong and just awareness that can be still. Hmm. See forms as forms, thoughts as thoughts, feelings as feelings without creating a self. That's making the whole system much more porous. And uh, I think faith as well. Faith is, uh, I think a lot of Westerners tend to think that faith is, yeah, I have faith in the Buddha. It's kind of a concept. I, I've, I've read the Four Noble Truths and that makes sense. So I have faith in that. And of course, <laughs> that's great. But compared to the sound of the Tamwat Yen at Wat Papong during the Ngans, where the 500 middle-aged middle -aged and upper-middle-aged ladies are chanting their evening chanting and the faith in the hall is just like you know wow mm. you know this to the bones every poor love of the buddha dharma and sangha it's not it's not a i read the four noble truths they make sense you know, no and, and maybe they need to you know maybe they do maybe they need to read it a bit more and contemplate it a bit more but in terms of in terms of the wholehearted, surrendering, loving commitment to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha that they, they have in their hearts in the Northeast Thailand, that generation. It's just uh, that kind of deep as is possible commitment to something hmm. is going to make the mind oriented towards progressing on that path and uh, and then that's going to make it receptive to intuitions about how to how to progress on that path, and also the you know the subtle bodied body beings who help practitioners. If uh, if a person is deeply deeply committed to practice, some of those beings will, will be interested in helping you. <laughs>